Our reading this morning is 2 Kings and chapter 6, 2 Kings and chapter 6, and it's quite a short reading. We're going to start at verse 1, 2 Kings 6 and verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So we went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And put out his hand. He put out his hand and took it. And may God bless this short reading to our hearts this morning. It's two weeks now since we were looking at the passages with, that we're dealing with Elijah and Elisha. Now, we've been looking at them for quite some time now. But two weeks ago we were looking at Elisha's servant Gehazi. And we were covering the aspect of how Gehazi's hypocrisy was exposed. And we're told that he became a leper and also all his family afterwards. But now we're in a new part in chapter 6 in this story today. It took place in about the year 8 BC during the time of the kings, whenever the kings of Israel were split and the two kingdoms, there was Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And we're told that after the prophet Elijah was taken to heaven, and we have already covered this, and the fiery chariot, the prophet Elisha then took over the ministry, reminding us again that God buries his workmen, but he continues his work. Elisha is now training other young prophets, the prophets of God. We're told they've been traveling around, they've been visiting the different schools of the prophets. And where we started to read in verse 1 tells us that this, because the term we would use today is a Bible college, that this Bible college is too small for the students, and so they're going to have to extend. The request was that they would go unto Jordan and that every man would take a beam. And we're told that Elisha responded with his blessing and he answered, Go ye. But then we're told that Elisha, of course, at this time was quite old. The younger prophets would not be expecting him to do the work of a young man. But they desire that he would come and that he would be their mentor. And so one of the students approaches Elisha and they say to Elisha, look, will you join us at this building project? And Elisha goes with them. Uh, You were told that, of course, the reason why Elisha would have gone would have been that he would be their mentor. He would also be an inspiration to them and certainly a great encouragement. And so the verses goes on as to how they arrive at Jordan and they begin the work of rebuilding or building this new school of the prophets or this new Bible college. And we see, of course, Elisha's uh, humility, his wisdom, and the very fact that he went with them. Though they were all prophets, they realized their need of this mentor, someone that they could look up to, someone that maybe they could share problems with, and so Elisha goes with them. And we see the wisdom a little later on in the story whenever one of these young men uh, loses the axe head and he calls to the prophet that he might guide even in the restoration of this piece of iron or steel. And so not only did Elisha give us permission for the prophets, he was also willing to accompany them and to lend his support and his encouragement. 
And that's very important, of course, for us, whether we're parents or grandparents or neighbors or friends or Sunday school teachers or Bible class teachers or whatever, that we might be there to encourage even younger ones that may need to be encouraged. And of course, there will be those times like David, whenever you and I will have to encourage ourselves in the things of God. One thing Elisha wanted to do, and that was he wanted to lead by example. He wasn't going to uh, get these folk to do something that he wasn't prepared to have some part in this. And so chapter 6 through to chapter 8 uh, continues with the story of the ministry of Elisha in the midst of times of national uh, decay and uh, things, of course, was at a very low end. Chapter 6 falls into two main sections. The first, it continues to record the wonderful uh, works of Elisha. The first seven verses we've read this morning, he caused the iron to swim. Then he discloses the secret counsels of the king of Syria to the king of Israel in verses 8 down to verse 12. Then he delivers himself out of the hands of those who were sent to apprehend him. And verses 13 down to verses 23. But this uh, section here, uh, the first seven verses of chapter 6, uh, records the besiege of Samaria by the Syrians and the terrible to distress the city was reduced to. Elisha is seen as a great blessing from God to both God's people and also to the nation at this time. And I want us to keep in mind that as we have read the Word of God, we need to always remember that as we study the Word of God, we must remember the historical fact accounts of Elisha and Israel that they're not only true, but they're also part of the inspired Word of God. The inspired Word. Now, I Paul writing to Timothy, and 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 16 reminds us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Why was it given to us? All scripture is given and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto good works, unto all good works. This means that these stories illustrate some eternal truths to us, that are relevant to us today and any time in history that has passed or what may lie before us. And so the story simply goes like this. The building was too small. Don't miss the fact that this account stands in contrast to the story of Gehazi. And I do hope that you are registering the Word of God, that you go back over the Word of God, And if something is said that is not what's in the Word of God, well then it's your responsibility to approach me about it. If there is any heresy that you find is there. Don't go to somebody else. Come to me. That's the the, the way to do it. Uh, Don't go to your neighbor or to your friend or somebody in front of you or beside you. Always go to the person themselves. And so... Uh, here was a whole school of men who, in the midst of Gehazi's deceit and hypocrisy, there was this whole school of men who were faithful to God, who were sacrificial and devoted to the spread of the Word of God. It reminds us, of course, that among God's people, there are usually some Gehazi-like people. Those that may profess God's name, those maybe that do not live the Christian life, But whenever that is the case, we should never allow that to discourage us or cause us to become cynical because as we look around, we will always find that amongst the people of God, there will be those who are faithful. I'm reading through the New Testament, reading the other day about the wheat and the tares. And that will always be there, I believe, until Jesus comes back again. I want you to notice that Elisha, in the school of the prophets of God, they're growing. But these are men that are hungry for the Word of God. Uh, they're hungry for the Word of God. You know, we live in a land today where there's a great dearth, as it were, for the, the Word of God. 
if there's some very highfalutin story to be told or that, there'll be more interest in that than there will in the pure study of God's word. But the Bible tells me in this passage that every man had a job to do. Their approach to solving the problem of space shows us a lot about the character of these men. They hadn't much, by the way, of financial resources uh, because we're told one man is using a borrowed axe. He obviously couldn't afford to buy his own. They were industrious, they were hard-working men and I, I noticed that their lack of resources didn't stop them from starting to build. Each man was willing to do his part to help meet the need yet undoubtedly they were ultimately resting on the resources that God would supply all their need. It is not seeing the difficulties that prevents action, but it's failing to see the resources. God calls you to do something for him. Don't look at ourselves, because we've got to look beyond that to the resources of God, that the wonderful promises that are given to us in his word. They weren't expecting someone else to do the work for them. They were willing to do it themselves. We often say that a very good test sometimes, as the little test of every church member, was just like me, what kind of church would my church be? Would there be anybody to pray? Anybody to give out books? Anybody to open the door? I, um, that's a very good test. And so these men were willing to all work. They were very realistic. They were looking for a place to meet their requirements. They weren't looking for some marble palace or that. They were looking for something that would meet the need of this Bible college. And so verses 1 to 4, we have a pattern of wholehearted service. They were burdened about the need for service. They said, let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan. And they were going to go where there was going to be a supply, where there was need, and so on. They were burdened about the need for service, and they recognized the need, and they were anxious to get on with the work. Oh, it's so easy to recognize the need, and yet we don't want to do anything in the work of God. So, so easy. So easy to say, oh, we need camps, we need youth clubs, we need this, but don't ask me to get involved in anything. That's not the type of attitude uh, these uh, young men had. No, they were commissioned men were told that they were going with the blessing of Elisha upon them. Uh, They all took a share. Every man joined the task. They were energetic. They were keen workers. They were equipped with the right tools for uh, felling trees. Uh, There's one thing that I never really cherished doing whenever I was young, and that was working with wood. My father had a country sawmill. We knew what it was, a big family of us, to get out with a hatchet and to peel off wood and all the rest of it. That closed down, I think I'm right in saying, was 1978, uh, over 40 years ago, and the last wood that was cut there was from the Glen Avon Hotel here in Crookstown. So it came a long way from Glen Avon. But I never liked uh, saws. I suppose after I come to Crookstown, I had an accident with one and I mean, better to avoid them. And, of course, as a result of finishing Dundonald Hospital for most of a week over it. But uh, there was, uh, these men here, they were going to work, and uh, they were going to work at cutting down this wood. But we could say that there was a problem to be avoided because one of the workers loses his axe head, the sharp cutting edge of all his service, he didn't lose the handle, and so from a distance it might have seemed, it might have appeared that everything was okay. And so I would say that the spiritual significance of this passage today is losing our cutting edge for God. It's possible to lose it. It's possible to lose our keenness for God. As we'll sing a little later on in William Cooper's hymn, whenever he was in a backslidden state, and he wrote that hymn, Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the blessedness? I want you to notice whenever he, was, he lost the axe head, it was a gradual process. It became loose, and then it fell into the water. That reminds me, of course, of backsliding. Uh, whenever 
someone backslides and they lose their effectiveness and their enthusiasm and their power for God. It doesn't happen overnight. Oh, it may, it may look as if it does, not at all. There'll be a gradual process. Gradual process that will take place. I want you to notice, dear friend, that he was a man and he lost his power while he was working. While he was working. Perhaps he was working too energetically. He was very, very conscious of his loss. He was in great distress about his loss because the axe head was borrowed. The late Noah Reid from the church here used to have a little saying, I used to hear it repeated at different times, a bar nor a lander be. Maybe not a bad policy, I don't know how scriptural that would be though. But I, that was no one of Nora's little proverbs anyway. I want to ask you a question, dear friend, this morning. Have you lost the cutting edge for God? Lost the accent? I'm sure you'll notice it. I'm sure it'll not be too long to other people will notice it. Maybe your family will notice it. Maybe your friends will notice it. It'll not be too long. You see, you... I maybe used to have power resting on you. You used to cry out for the things of God, but the kingdom of God was always sought first. But that's history. That's history. If so, I want to say, dear, dear, dear friend, to you this morning, this story assures you that it may be restored. You may be reinstated. You may be re-equipped for the service of God. Have you lost your spiritual sharpness for God. Sadly, we're living in a day when many have. It ties up with the words of the Lord Jesus where he says that the cares of this world, cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and we become unfruitful. I want you to notice the responsibility that this man took when he discovered it was lost. Verse 5 tells us, uh, But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. I understand that that word, alas, it literally means, Oh, no. Oh, no. And it's a word maybe sometimes that you can use and I can use. Maybe we'll say, Oh, no, I've lost my glasses. Oh, no, where did I set down my keys? Oh no, where's my wallet? This young man here, he has lost his axe head and he said, I've lost it and it's borrowed. You see, the fact is that this young man lost something which didn't belong to him. And that means that it takes on even greater significance. He lost something that was not his to lose. He lost something that belonged to another. I want you to notice he didn't blame anyone else for what had happened to him. He took responsibility. We live in a day whenever nobody wants to take responsibility for anything. I was reading in the Times there a couple of weeks ago where somebody was writing about customer services. And they said the worst thing about customer services is people who couldn't care less. (laughs) And I don't know, maybe there's times we've used customer services and we've never got very far I, with them, but that's how it is. Forgive me for using a personal illustration, but a couple of weeks ago we were going to England, and I, my wife always brags about the suitcase that she has, it's suitable for flyby and easy jet and all the rest of it. Now, I work with even a smaller, it's all hand luggage. And I, what happened was we were standing there in Belfast, waiting to... I board whenever one of the flyby people started putting people aside. And they started saying, oh no, your case doesn't meet the requirements. And I, you're going to have to pay an extra £50 pound because you haven't booked it in. So my wife had to pay it. She said she wasn't going to let it ruin her holiday. But as soon as we arrived in London, I went to the desk and I said to three of the members of staff, that my wife has been charged £50 for this here, and Flybe told me over in uh, London City Airport, oh, that suitcase 
is acceptable. But what happens is in Belfast they use a different measurement than they do. I couldn't work that out. Of course, I contacted uh, customer services. I've yet to hear a thing about them. But I did read in the paper where there's many people experiencing that and they don't get anywhere. So I think my wife has to conclude she lost her 50 quid. But I'm sure the next time the case will be that wee bit smaller. And of course that's how uh, we learn things in life. But uh, this man here, he took responsibility for his loss. He didn't blame anyone else for what happened to him. You see, whenever we lose our spiritual cutting edge, we must accept responsibility for it. We can point out the finger maybe at the preacher and say, as sermons are boring, they don't feed me. Maybe we can point the finger and say, well, the church that we attend, I, well, they don't offer all the programs and they don't fulfill all my personal needs and so that's why I'm not as keen for God as I used to. Many today point the finger at their job and say, well, my job takes me away from church. Oh, I've met people over the years and they point the finger to parents and they'll say, oh, whenever I was a wee lad, my father beat me sore. I'm sure we all got crashings at times, but sadly those seems to keep some people stuck. It's sad. It's sad. But that's how we have it. You know, dear friends, we can point our fingers at everyone, but the truth is when we lose our spiritual edge, the blame lies with us. We must accept full responsibility. You see, we need to understand what we lost was borrowed because God has entrusted you and I with spiritual gifts to be used for his work. (coughs) Excuse me. We're not the owners of those gifts, we're only the stewards. The second thing that this man did is what we must do if we've lost our spiritual cutting edge, edge, we must acknowledge where we lost it. The man of God asked the question, where fell it? And we're told in verse 6, he showed him the place. And if you've lost out with God, it'll not matter where you float to, It'll not matter what church you attend. It'll not matter if you change families or change partners. It'll not matter if you move to Scotland or to America. It'll be the same person. And until you return to that spot, you'll never get through to God. And so we're told here that this man, he showed him the place where he fell it, and the young man pointed Elisha to the very spot. The lessons that we have to learn here is before that we can recover something that is lost, I have to go back to the place where it was lost. I'm sure many of you are like myself. You're always losing things, setting things down. Then you'll have to retrace your steps and say, well, Daphne, I come into this room or that room. I think maybe you could have sat it there or there. You retrace those steps. And any time that... We lose our spiritual edge, our spiritual effectiveness and enthusiasm. We need to acknowledge where we lost it. Did it happen whenever I stopped reading my Bible and praying every day and taking time out for God? Is that where I began to get careless and I lost my cutting edge for God? Did it happen whenever I stopped going to the house of God regularly? Did it happen whenever I became jealous or envious or I I have an embittered spirit? Because until that's dealt with, no matter, dear friends, where you go or what you do, the cutting edge will never be returned to acknowledge the place. Did it happen when I became upset about something that was said to me in church or in a meeting or Sunday school? Did it happen when I got mad with the pastor that, and I started tuning out of his sermons? Did it happen when I went back to some old sinful habit? Is that the place? Maybe no one else knows anything about it. Is that where it happened? You see, our tendency is to keep on chopping and chopping and not realize that the axe head is missing. I told a story in the prayer meeting a couple of weeks ago. I said I'd repeat it whenever I'd come to this passage about a young boy who I sought out a job in a logging company and he started on the Monday. And he worked really hard on Monday. And then he worked really hard on Tuesday and on Wednesday. And on Thursday morning, the logging company manager called him aside 
And they said, we're going to let you go. And the young man said, why? I've been working so hard. I can't work any harder. I work even my coffee breaks and my dinner breaks. I work whenever everybody else has gone home. Why are you letting me go? And the manager asked him a question. Are you taking time to sharpen your axe? And the answer was no. And you know, in a spiritual sense, dear friend, we must take time to sharpen the axe. This world is no friend of grace here. And with this I'm through today. And with verse 7, therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. You must take action to recover the spiritual edge. The tragedy is that many people today has lost their enthusiasm, their cutting edge, their enthusiasm for God, and they're quite happy with it. I trust to God that I'll never enter into the presence of God without enthusiasm, without seeking to hear that well done of God. What was said in verse 7, pick it up yourself. And he put out his hand. What was Elisha seeking to teach this young man? Uh, By having him to do it himself, one thing that reminded the young man was of the value of what he had lost. The value. And dear friend, whatever takes away your zeal for God and uh, um, dims your view and your vision for the things of God has a very little value very little value in the light of eternity. He had lost something that belonged to another. He had lost something which he was not able to afford to repay. Perhaps maybe Elisha is teaching the young man a very valuable lesson in the grace of God that this young man was powerless to recover what was lost until he came back to this place and he points it out where he's lost the cutting edge. Elisha wanted him to take the axe head by faith and go back to chopping down the trees. It means we must take action. If we have been neglecting God's word, we need to get back to the word of God. If we've been neglecting our prayer life, we need to get back to the prayer life. If we have an embittered, critical spirit, bad attitude in that, the scripture is so much to say about that, far more to say about that than even same-sex marriage or adultery. Far, far more If we read the New Testament at all, we'll discover that. We've got to deal with that. We've been neglecting the house of God. We must deal with that. We can lose our spiritual edge, not only once, but even many, many times. This young man was humble, and he was very honest. And we're told that the iron did swim. Therefore he said, take it up to thee, And he put out his hand and he took it. And I want to say, dear friends, today, before a thrice holy God, if you've lost the cutting edge, you can keep battling away, you can keep up an old profession, you can do this, that or the other thing. But until you get back to God and back to blessing, you're just hammering away. You need the cutting edge back. We're going to conclude with our closing hymn is in the hymn book 556 and we'll stand to sing.